sort of project that uh, is sort of in both fields, there's a way to do your final thesis as a, as a interdisciplinary project. Um, and we're currently accepting applications uh, for the foreseeable future and probably until um, early summer. So, so consider this program. Uh, the other reason why we're here tonight is, well, the title is Hooked on Mathematics. And uh, for everyone who, who enjoys math and would even consider uh, enrolling in a graduate program in math, you, you have to somehow have fallen in love with math at some point, you have to gotten uh, hooked. Um, and every one of us has like a little problem or a little idea or set of ideas that um, excited us about mathematics and got us hooked. So that's, that's the other reason why I'm excited about this event tonight. Um, so the, the, the format of the event is we have a panel consisting of uh, five people, uh, two NMU faculty, um, including myself, and three of our current uh, MS Math graduate students. Um, and they've, they've graciously given their Wednesday evening um, to share with you uh, a blurb about themselves, as well as some exciting, controversial, interesting uh, math tidbit, math problem that hopefully will, uh, that got them hooked on mathematics and hopefully can uh, ignite an interesting discussion for us tonight. Um, so the, the layout is gonna be, uh, I'm gonna pass it off to each uh, presenter who will give a blurb about themselves and then their math problem. So we will accumulate five interesting math tidbits. Um, and then, then we'll open it up to a kind of a free form discussion with everyone and we'll take questions from the, from the audience. So, um, so without further ado, then I wanna, I wanna pass it off to uh, Anthony Webb. Anthony, go ahead. Hello, everyone. Um, so my name is Anthony Webb. Um, I actually grew up about 30 minutes west of here in Ishpeming, so I'm local to this area. Um, and I came here for my undergrad to get a degree in secondary math education. Um, so a high school math teacher, I got a minor in biology, so I can teach high school math and biology. And I got into the program here, the master's program. Um, um, it was just starting to be a new thing. And I heard it was an option and I was still on the fence if I wanted to go into teaching at a high school level or a college level. And it seemed like a perfect opportunity. Um, to piggyback off what Dr. Rowe was saying is he was talking about a question that got you hooked on math. Um, I have a pretty interesting story that happened here because a professor asked me in my sophomore level mathematics modeling class um, a question. And so he asked me, we were looking at a question of circles and we were putting circles around other circles and then we took it um, even farther and he said what if we did it with spheres around another sphere so like ping pong balls around a beach ball and he asked me to try to estimate if he gave me a hundred ping pong balls how big would the beach ball have to be and well i was never able to answer that question um, but i took the information that i learned along the way and i said hey I could estimate how many gumballs fit in a gumball machine. And he thought that was really cool. And he ended up helping me present that um, at LSSU, Lake Superior State University and here at NMU. And then after that, um, it's a small world here because then Dr. Rowe started teaching at NMU and I took the problem to him and he said, hey, we could make that more generic. And we could look at these platonic solids or the five D&D dice that you're used to seeing the six-sided dice, the eight-sided dice, the 12-sided dice even. And we did research with that. Um, I was part of the McNair program who at the time, Heather, who was also on the panel, she was in charge of at the time. Um, really small world up here, it seems. And um, I did research over the summer. We got enough information to write a good sized paper that we're still trying to get published. And um, building off of that information then, um, would be leading into my thesis work. We're gonna go beyond what I was able to do as an undergrad. Um, but that also, and then, sorry, the talk, I was able to talk with the stuff I did at McNair and the stuff with Dr. Rowe. I was able to actually talk um, at NMU again and at a national a conference, the MAA conference down in Columbus, Ohio. And all of that started with just one question and it tipped the dominoes all the way down to me presenting in Columbus, Ohio, which is crazy. I can't believe I was able to do that. Um, and the question was just, if you have a penny and you wanted to surround it with pennies, how many pennies do you need? 
And then it built a little more into it now if you have a quarter in the middle, but it all started with surround a penny with pennies, how many, how many fit? And so now Dr. O, I believe then, it, oh, uh, am I talking more about that or? Perfect, uh, Anthony, thank you very much for sharing that. Um, yeah, so uh, for Anthony, it seems that what hooked him on mathematics was how many pennies fit around another penny or how many gumballs fit in a gumball machine. So you never know what's gonna get a person interested in math. So, okay, I'm gonna pass it off next to um, Katie. Katie, one of our current grad students, go ahead and take over. Yeah, okay, so my name is Katie Zybel. Um, my hometown is Escanaba, Michigan, so I grew up just an hour south of here. Uh, I did my undergrad here at NMU as well. Um, ironically enough, when I came here, I was a forensic biochem major. Um, I was more focused in the sciences. I enjoyed my bio classes in high school. Um, I started taking chemistry classes and I found they weren't for me. Um, also, pre-med classes, um, there was always stuff that I enjoyed in these classes, but I could never find anything that I was truly passionate about um, until I ended up in my first physics class where I wasn't a lab person. I found that what I loved in all of these classes was the math aspect. I mean, chemistry uses a lot of math, uh, bio uses some stats. So I took my first Calc 3 class and I was like, yep, this is what I should be doing, which is crazy to think about because when I left um, high school, I took up to Calc 2 and I actually got to take Calc 2 and Calc 1 through um, the dual enrollment program at, uh, through NMU at Escanaba. Um, I was actually taking Dr. Lawton's exams as a senior in high school, which I think is funny to think back now. Um, so I should have known that mathematics was probably my calling there. Um, so in my undergrad, uh, I was a tutor in the math lab. I was a teaching assistant for some of the intro math classes. And then I also graded a little bit for Dr. Lawton. Um, and the cool thing is that given these small class sizes that we have here at NMU and the many opportunities that um, the math department gave me, I quickly grew relationships with uh, many of the professors here. Um, in particular, I took most of my undergrad math classes through uh, Dr. Rowe and Dr. Lawton, uh, which is how I ended up grading for Dr. Lawton. And um, the best part is that this semester in grad school, they're both my professors again. So it's really nice to um, see familiar faces. Um, it's just a way more comforting uh, than going off to some master's program where you don't know anybody. This was a good way to kind of ease into um, the graduate level classes. Um, so how did I end up in the program? Well, I graduated in December, 2019, and I didn't really know what to do next. Um, graduating in the middle of an academic year was pretty awkward. A lot of programs didn't start till the fall. Um, but then I was thinking, should I take a gap semester? Um, what happened was the master's program here, um, I was asked, you should apply. Like, even if you don't wanna go, like just apply, uh, maybe you like it. And I think it's just um, what happened was I was in the right place at the right time because it ended up being perfect for me. I didn't know if I was ready to leave Marquette. Um, and it was just, uh, it worked out really well. So um, my favorite classes that I took in undergrad were a lot of the applied math. Um, which is nice because now in our program, we have both the pure math route and then we have the actuarial sciences route, which is what I am pursuing. So um, that's a little bit about me. Um, so I'll jump into my problem, which uh, it's kind of a random one. It went viral two summers ago. And the reason I present it is because I've never seen so many people that um, don't care for math, care for math a little bit, um, just for a little while at least. So. The problem I'm gonna present is just, it's a simple equation. It is eight divided by two times the quantity two plus two. Um, so everyone referred to PEMDAS, the order of operations, uh, where we do two plus two first. So we do eight divided by two times four. And then this is where the big controversy started. Do you divide, um, eight divided by two first, or do you multiply first? Well, if we do eight divided by two, and then uh, multiply by four, so eight divided by two is uh, four times four, and we get 16. But it was also argued, well, what if we do two times four first, and then we do eight divided by eight, and we get the answer of one. Um, many experts have gotten involved in this discussion as well, which started out as just some viral, um, Twitter, Facebook, wherever you found it. Um, it was just very funny that many people were talking about math at the same time. Um, experts say it's both. Um, modern order of operations say that it's 16, but it kind of just depends on how you prioritize multiplication and division. 
So that's all from me. Okay, thanks, Katie. Um, it, is there a way to unshare the screen or, or oh, there we go, we're back. Um, perfect. All right, thanks, Katie. Uh, that's very interesting. Okay, now I'm gonna pass it off to another current student, uh, Chad. Go ahead, Chad. Hi, everybody. My name is Chad Leisenring. Um, I was an NMU transfer. I came to NMU to teach. Um, I did computer science for two years, realized I wanted to teach and heard so many good things about uh, NMU as teaching program. Uh, both my parents were at one point NMU grads. So I got my BS in just mathematics um, and I knew that I wanted to teach and the math program was opening up and it had the opportunity for me to be able to teach as a graduate assistant. Um, and so now through my master's program, I'm on semester four of getting to teach. I'm going to come out of this program with incredible, interesting coursework in both the applied fields. Uh, I'm working on my actuary coursework, studying for financial mathematics and probability, while simultaneously getting to explore crazy concepts like different algebras, loops, rings, uh, topology, and a bunch of different things that I never was exposed to as an undergrad. And I think the combination of getting the professional experience, getting to get feedback and development as a teacher from people doing it, from professors doing it, and have had experience at both the K-12 and college level, I think all of those things made this program perfect for me. And I really have loved my master's experience. So anyone out there thinking, oh, I, like, I want to maybe teach at the college level, and I maybe want to teach at the high school K-12, it was completely worth it. The, just the amount of foundational different things you'll see in the math world has been incredible with this program. Um, and I've loved it. And I'm so, I'm, I'm sad that I'm graduating. I might come get my computer science master's. Who knows if they'll stop me. Um, why I think I got really hooked on math is I'm a competitive person. I really love uh, games. I love the problems. I love the math that goes with it. And the one little, I have 1.2 problems that I'm gonna be showing. And the first one is the Monty Hall pro, uh, problem. So when you're playing uh, Price is Right, there's three doors you get to pick from. One of the door has a car and two of the doors have zonks, donkeys, whatever they are behind them. And you get to pick one of the doors. They then show you a donkey in one of the two doors you pick and you get the opportunity to swap it. You can say, I wanna stick with my door or I want to go with the door that is still closed. And for the longest time, the assumption was, okay, they've opened a door. Now it's a 50-50 chance. What it truly is, is it turns out it's a uh, one third and two third chance for picking and not picking the door. So by the nature of the problem, there's always going to be a donkey remaining. They are, there's three options, two of them are donkeys. If you pick a donkey, they can still show a donkey. And if you pick a car, they can still show two of, uh, one of the two donkeys. So you should always swap in this problem because the outcomes are listed here. Let's say that you pick the car in your first problem or you pick one of the two donkeys. Your three outcomes are here. The two doors could be donkey car, car donkey, or both donkeys. If you then get revealed one of those donkeys, you can see now that when you swap, the three outcomes are either car, car, or donkey. So by swapping, you're basically picking the probability of, I didn't pick the car right off the bat. I have a one third chance to pick the car and my other two were donkeys, but I have a two thirds chance that I didn't pick the car. So by swapping with the Price is Right game, instead of picking, I want this one, you can say, I don't want this one and have a two thirds chance of getting the prize rather than a one thirds chance, which actually is unlike um, uh, deal or no deal. deal. Deal or no deal is not a Monty Hall problem uh, because it's blindly stepping through those steps. So that's a little fun game math. And my 1.2 problem is that there is a total of 142 ways that you can combine your victory points to win Settlers of Catan. Ah, nice. 
I like the Settlers of Catan connection. That's a fun game as well. 142 ways. 142. The Monty Hall is truly remarkable. I saw it for the first time in undergrad in a philosophy class and the room of students were just, people were upset that switching shouldn't matter, but yeah, you win two thirds, it's, it's crazy. Like Monty Hall is amazing. Um, okay, so I guess it's my turn now. So uh, yeah, so I wanna weigh in on the Pi versus Tau debate. People are passionate about this. Um, so this debate, basically, you've got these constants in math. There's pi, which people talk about. It's the ratio of the circumference of a circle to the diameter. So basically, distance around to the distance across the middle of a circle is always pi, which is 3.141592, and then it goes on and on and on. Okay. But there's a contingent of people out there that would like uh, twice pi, two times pi, which is which is 6.28318, so on. They, they want that to be called tau. Uh, it, it deserves its own name. And then some of them are so adamant that when you say pi, you should say tau divided by two. It's, 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 quite, it's quite egregious, but there is actually, so I, I originally, when I heard about this debate, I thought it was silly. If you look back to Leonard Euler, this famous mathematician, he would just use circle constants. You know, it's kind of like, centimeters and meters or, or feet and inches. Like you can use either one, you can convert back and forth. It's not a big deal. But there was something I discovered. Um, there was something I discovered that made me kind of come over a little bit to the Tau camp. Um, and that's this, the Rouleau triangle. The Rouleau triangle, it's kind of an interesting shape. Um, basically that vertexes are the edges of an equilateral, the, the points of an equilateral triangle. And then you've got these three circles that are centered, that are centered at those vertices. And then you take the common, common intersection of those circles and you create this shape. Now, Rouleau was a, Franz Rouleau was a German mathematician, or sorry, a German engineer who used these shapes a lot in his engineering work. And it really is a very interesting shape. So, so there, are, there are coins, there are coins that are, built off this shape. This is the Canadian loony, which is basically an 11 sided version of the Rouleau triangle. And this is a um, 20 pence piece from the UK, which is essentially a, a seven sided version of the Rouleau. Um, and this, this shape is interesting. The reason why it's interesting is that it has a constant width. If you sandwich it with a pair of boards, if you, if you decide I'm gonna measure its width, it's the same everywhere. It has a constant width. So you could say that it has a constant diameter, but if you measure it's the ratio of the distance around the outside, so the circumference or the perimeter divided by the constant width, it's also pi. It's also pi. So it, it really is interesting that there are these shapes out there that are not circles that for which pi makes sense. Circumference divided by diameter is pi. So therefore, I think that I might be kind of coming over to the tau camp a little bit um, because, because if you want a constant that is totally just about the circle and nothing else, just about the circle, the only thing that a circle, the, the, the only shape with a constant radius is the circle. So the circle constant then deserves to be rather than so, so pi is C divided by D, but that's not unique to circles. The only constant that is unique to circles is C divided by the radius, which is twice pi, which is tau. So, so pi people like to celebrate on March 14th, pi day. I guess tau people would celebrate on June 28th, but it's a very contentious issue. So my question to the group is, which do you think is better? What's the better circle constant, tau or pi? I just think it's kind of interesting. Oh, and before I end, I just wanted to mention that that Rouleau triangle uh, actually comes up in lots of different places. So we saw the coins, uh, there's drill bits that are designed to drill out square shaped holes that use that shape. Uh, you see that shape in windows of like old buildings, like old churches and stuff like that. Um, there's some pencils that have that Rouleau triangle shape. The nuts on fire hydrants, have that shape. Um, guitar picks sometimes are Rouleau triangles. 
Uh, there's even a bicycle wheels. There's this Chinese inventor named Guan Baihua uh, recently uh, invented a bicycle with the, that shape wheel. So it's kind of rough. Like when you're driving it, it kind of bangs along. But his claim was that you could get a, you could get a workout. You could get a workout using it. Um, and he can, he's like the only person I know who could go to someone and say, I reinvented the wheel. And sewer drain covers, like uh, sewer drain covers, sometimes they're circles. And the, I, the beauty is that they can't fall down the hole because they're really heavy. You don't want them to fall down the hole. But rouleau triangles, because they have a constant width, also work as sewer drain covers because they can't fall back down the hole. Anyway, all right, I'm done with that. That's my hooked on mathematics problem. I'm going to pass it off to uh, Josh Thompson. Go ahead, Josh. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Josh Thompson. I'm a professor in the math department here at Northern. I moved here about eight or nine years ago. And I wasn't always uh, thinking I would be a professor in college. I was planning to teach in high school. I wanted to coach football. I was kind of a jock. And then at some point during the course of a linear algebra exam, something like bit me and and I got hooked and I wanted more, I wanted to know more. And so graduate school happened and in graduate school, I discovered geometry and topology and I felt like I could um, understand things at a very fundamental way without having to get lost in some of the more technical questions. And so I really, um, appreciate this idea of choosing your specific, your, your favorite number, uh, tau versus pi. And I want to sort of add to this, to this choice here. Um, let me just make sure I, you can see my numbers. I want to add to this choice, some of my favorite numbers. So we have, uh, zero is a good number. One is also a good number. And you might have to, bear with me thinking of infinity as a number because really it's it's not a number right we we i tell my students quite frequently that you know we have to be careful it's not because a limit we because because we say the limit equals infinity it doesn't really mean it's actually a, a a spot that you can land on but it does have some numerical qualities i mean you can we have a sort of a an arithmetic of infinity where we say two times infinity is infinity or infinity plus infinity is infinity. So we, we, we speak of it quite, quite as a number. So I do like this idea of, of, of zero, one and infinity. One reason I like it is because we see this trichotomy all the time in mathematics. So differential equations will all will frequently have either no solution they might have one solution or they might have infinitely many solutions. Two lines, for example, well, if they're parallel, well, they have no solution. If they intersect once, they will, they, they have one solution and it, they may, have, may in fact be the same line. So we see this trichotomy in, in linear algebra and geometry and, and systems of equations all the time. So maybe what I'm saying is three is my favorite number. Um, so one other uh, thing I like about mathematics is the ways in which we can change our perception of things to make them to, to somehow learn more about the, the situation. So for example, maybe instead of thinking this of these three um, little pieces of brass that were made, speaking of Escanaba, uh, by Carter Moore Murray, who is a former undergraduate uh, of the math department here, and also an Escanaban. Um, perhaps you can, we should think of these objects not as, not as numbers, but as three dimensional objects. So if, so as a topologist, I like to think of, of three dimensional shapes and I like to just imagine a world where um, things are, are fluid and can be boiled down or bent and stretched and twisted into, into equivalent forms. And so, from that regard, one might could consider reshaping this, this number one here into maybe a solid ball. And so that in some ways would be fundamentally different than from what we have here is this sort of, this sort of a donut shape. Um, and so we, in, in some ways we could look at this. And so a topologist would look at this and say zero, one, and two, where two would, 
count the number of holes here. And yet again, this reflects a trichotomy, if you will, where in terms of the in terms of the curvature, if you were to be a little a little ant living on these objects, once you once you deform this little guy back down to a solid ball, then you're you're sort of that ant is living on a a, a sphere. And so at, that's that's quite different than what's happening here on on this on this uh, donut shape on the sphere right if you imagine you're living at the north pole everywhere you walk is 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 down as opposed to what's happening here there's sort of this little little point of of curvature where you can go up on either side but if you walk either towards the screen or back there's a sort of a saddle shape you'll be going down and so that's makes contrast between these two and then we sort of increase the complexity here. And so that is a, the very beginning of an interesting trichotomy in what's called curvature, where um, each of these three objects um, in some ways represent uh, various three different kinds of geometric curvature. And so I think, I think if I have to choose between tau and, and pi, I think I'll go with pi because it's closer to my favorite number, which is three. All right, that's fair enough, Josh. Uh, although I, I'm sort of, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm wondering, is, is that infinity also uh, potentially an eight? Yes. <laughs> uh, no. Um, okay, well, that's basically the, 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 the panel for tonight and what we wanted to share. So the rest of the evening, I, I'm, um, imagining uh, putting it to uh, the whole group, including the audience, to discuss these five little math tidbits that we've, we've shared and, um, and just basically go with it until we're all tired and wanna go to sleep for the night. So um, how, do we, how do we get questions from the audience? Is there any questions that the audience has out there? Yeah, and for the people in the bottom, our attendees, on the bottom, there's a QA part of the chat, and that lets you send us questions that we can check out. I will say, waiting for questions, I am a Pi supporter for two just totally arbitrary reasons. One, if you shrink Pi, I, so I used to have to use this physics software, and it would make these equations itty bitty tiny on the screen. And I could never tell if it was a row or an R because we used both of them in the equation, but you can always tell what pi looks like. If you shrink tau, it might be a T, it might be another variable, but you always know what pi looks like. Ah, and, so, so your concerns are uh, typographical. Yep, yeah. just totally, totally semantics. <laughs> my, my part two is, I think of it as, um, kind of how like they register inputs on video game controllers where all the way left is negative one and all the way right is positive one. With pi, you have 180 degrees. If you're looking forward, that's zero. If I spin 180 degrees to my left, that's negative pi. From regular orientation, if I spin all the way to the right, that's positive pi. If I do that with tau, I either have to split tau in the middle or decide I'm only going to interpret left turns as super right turns instead of here I can have a definition for left and right. Wow, those are two interesting perspectives on the pi tau debate that I've never thought of before, Chad. Thanks. Um, to piggyback off what you guys are saying about the pi and tau debate, I am pro pi because um, they, one of the arguments I've heard for tau is that the circumference formula, two pi r, would be much easier if it was just tau r, because mm -hmm. tau is two pi. But then when you get to the formula for radius, pi r squared, um, then it would have to be tau over two r squared. And there's already a squared in there, and then you throw a fraction in there, and that scares me. And so that, that's my belief, is I don't think it really simplifies formulas, even though some people will claim it will. 
Uh, one thing on that, Anthony, which I would uh, throw back at you is the, yes, the area for a circle is pi r squared. So in terms of tau, it's tau over two uh, r squared. But the argument for that being nice is, is kind of interesting. If you think about integration, you know, area is like an integral, then, you know, the integral of x we know is x squared over two. So there's something kind of natural about the area of a circle being tau r squared over two. So I think, I think I've heard that from some place that it was like, oh, interesting. And then, then there, there is this idea that um, in, in, any, in any sort of situation that relates to circles, whether it's trigonometry, um, uh, many math textbooks that relate to circular situations, you're going to see, I think you're gonna see two pi's in that textbook as constants appearing more frequently than pi's, but I don't have any, any, any real data on that. So, so I'm answering uh, a question in the chat of, of Matthew. I encourage folks to look at the Q and A at the bottom. Um, I, 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 Matthew asked me, why not, why can't you have two or three solutions to a differential equation? And why is it always zero, one and or infinity? And I was being a little coarse. Um, it, the, the trichotomy really is zero um, um, finite or infinite. You can, there are certainly situations where you, um, you, can, you can find a, a differential equation with three solutions. Um, the, uh, the, however, when, uh, when these solutions would correspond to geometric, um, have some geometric object behind them, like a like a, a, a curve or a, or a, um, a, a line. That's when the intersection would be restricted to zero, one, or infinity. So that's a good question, Matthew. I believe Eric's got a good question. Uh, Dan, do you want to? Yeah, I, I apologize. For some reason, I I was reading the wrong chat. I, I see now that there's this Q and A thing. That's just that's my bad. This is a I'll chalk that up to this being the first time I've done this. Okay, Eric, yes, thanks for your question. What is the format of the master's in math program? So it's a, it's a relatively classic MS in mathematics program. There's coursework and then there's, there's research. So there's 32 total credits, um, uh, six classes, four credits each. So 24 credits of, of your coursework that involves three core classes in mathematics, kind of like pillars of the subject, you know, um, Josh Thompson mentioned topology. That's one of the core classes. Uh, linear algebra, uh, grad level linear algebra is I think also very like fundamental to mathematics. So that's a core. And then an, um, um, analysis is the other core area of mathematics. So once you've accomplished those, then there's also uh, topics classes. So more, you know, more in depth and in other areas of math that touch on different things from um, the foundations of logic uh, to upper geometry things like curvature um, and connections and tensors uh, to, um, I know Chad mentioned rings and groups and loops and quasi groups and things from algebra, there's, there's, there's electives. So, there's, so there's, six, there's gonna be six total classes that you would take, three cores and three electives. And then otherwise there's eight credits of uh, research where you're working on your actuarial project if you're interested in uh, passing those actuarial exams or um, doing an interdisciplinary project or doing a sort of a traditional thesis in mathematics, which is a um, document which is formally formal and academic and potentially submittable to a journal for publication. But uh, you, you also have an a, a, a oral defense here, at, here on campus that um, sort of certifies the acceptance of the thesis and everything. So um, did I answer your question to satisfactory? Dr. Rowe, if you don't mind, I just want to jump in and just add a comment on that. Um, as all three of us, uh, Katie, Chad, and I, we are all um, teaching um, a class here at NMU while concurrently while we're taking the master's program classes. Um, and I know Chad and I, we both went into the, we want to go into the education field. And so that's very nice for us. Katie, it probably surprised her a little bit coming in and teaching a class when she wants to go into actuarialism. Um, 
but it's not a requirement to be in the master's program. We have the opportunity to teach, but you don't have to. So um, there are people in the program as well who are not teaching, who are going just for the math and the fun of it. Um, for whatever reasons, they didn't want to teach, um, and that's okay. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll add to that that if you are interested in teaching through the department, teaching a class, there is an application process. You'll, you'll have to apply and be approved. It's not, it's not a given. Um, but, but if you're interested in uh, having a, a kind of control over a math section and you, you won't be left to the wolves, you'll be organized. There's going to be faculty above you that take care of you and help you through the process. But it's a great chance to um, get your first experience with uh, teaching um, 100 level mathematics classes. And it can be a lot of fun if you enjoy that. Yeah, I'll also chime in. Um, so Chad and I are on the actuarial route where Anthony, I believe you are the peer math route. Mm -hmm. um, so the nice thing is I didn't really mind the teaching aspect um, just because I did have some comfort in undergrad being a teaching assistant and tutoring in the math lab. But what what's nice is um, in undergrad, what captured my um, interest in math was the applied stuff, of course. Um, and in particular, the probability classes, which um, is a lot of what my actuarial studying is going to be composed of. Um, and then I'm also lucky enough that I get to teach the intro to probability and statistics class. So I'm also getting to teach something that I'm um, very interested in as well. So it kind of all um, became the kind of perfect equation for me where the stuff that I'm interested in is the stuff I'm studying, which is also the stuff I'm teaching as well. Um, so just kind of a very lucky and fortunate situation on my part. Okay, I don't see any questions currently in the uh, Q and A. Uh, looks like we managed to cover those. Um, I, I, um, I'd love to talk about Monty Hall more with you, Chad, or 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 the the thing about Catan. Uh, so, am I understanding you correctly that in terms of the final figuring out who wins at Catan with the victory points and, and whatnot, you, you, you're, you're, you're saying that there's 142 different ways you can win or what was, what was that claim exactly about Catan? Yeah, so there's the, the different ways in Catan you can win. Um, you can win from, the goal is if when you hit 10 victory points, you win. Uh, creating cities and settlements give you one and two victory points. Having the longest road and the largest army each gives you two victory points. And then you can gain victory points from buying resource cards. And so I, you have to combine any number of those special meter bonuses, the cities you create in that to come together to get 10 or more victory points. Uh, in a standard game, it's 10. And you can go anywhere from getting exactly 10 points up to the upper edge case of uh, 12 points before the game ends through that combination of I've built cities, I have the longest road, I have these knight cards, which have given me the largest army. And between like, okay, I have seven points from cities and three points from victories, or I have longest road, largest army, and only two cities. There's a, they've, a guy wrote a whole paper about, here's the 142 ways you can win. Oh, that's great. Oh, there's a question now in the Q&A from Matthew. Uh, this is for Anthony. Anthony Webb, I have a question for you since you're going for pure math. What is that program like? What is the most interesting thing you are learning? Um, first of all, it's great. It's better than I expected, actually. Um, as I said, I went into undergrad as um, secondary math education. So I did have to take classes more advanced than a high school math setting. Um, but that was all I was expecting really to see every day would be high school math, algebra, geometry, trig, maybe a little bit of calculus if I got lucky. Um, so coming back into the program, then I had taken a little bit of time off. I was a little worried, am I gonna be able to get back into the swing of things, um, seeing that the math I've seen lately has been Y equals MX plus B and the quadratic formula. Um, and jumping back in, it was, it was actually fantastic. Um, first of all, the, the group we have here, the professors, the other students, my peers in the program opened me with welcome arms. Um, it was amazing. Um, and let me just look at the question again. Um, and so, I am going for pure math um, to get the degree to determine if I want to teach at a college setting or stick with the high school setting. Um, 
and there's a lot of help in the program. Um, they encourage me to, to seek out these questions. Like I said, as an undergrad, I was encouraged to look at something beyond how many pennies fit in, around another penny. Um, and I'm seeing more interesting things every day I'm in the program right now. Probably the most interesting thing I'm learning um, is actually in Dr. Rowe's class here with topology, where I'm taking rotations and reflections of different shapes and we're putting them into a matrix form. And then we're getting these fantastic and beautiful results in, in the matrix that show what we're doing. And I really like that because I learned when I was um, doing that project about the how many gumballs fit in a gumball machine, I learned my mind really likes pictures and I was able to connect pictures to math. And in Dr. Rowe's class here with these shapes, we're squishing and molding and stretching these shapes. Um, and so I can visualize it and I can picture having the Play-Doh in my hand and playing with it. But at the same time, it's relating to these pretty heavy matrices that we have to well reduce and solve for. Um, and so I'm having a blast with that right now. Um, and also, if you guys have been out there, I, I posed the question at the beginning, how many pennies fit around another penny? If you pulled out pennies, you would see six fit around it. And that actually has to do with the hexagon and how cool of a shape that is. Um, that's why bees like it. Mm -hmm. um, so I hope I answered that, Matthew. Um, if not, I will go I, more in depth. There's, a, there's so much we could talk about with the program, but we only have so little time. I might, I might interject there just for Matthew's benefit that that class that you're talking about or that Anthony's talking about, Matthew, is uh, our, our core topology. So I'm trying to talk about algebraic topology and um, homology and cohomology, which is an interesting, it's a great synthesis between linear algebra and the thing that Josh Thompson was talking about in his, in his spiel about, about bending and flexing those shapes. You know, why is a ball different than a donut? And why is that different than a donut with two holes? You know, what, what can you say to say that those are not transformable and meltable into each other? And interestingly, uh, linear algebra comes to the rescue and uh, algebraic topology is this great synthesis of um, linear algebra and, and uh, shapes basically. Um, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to um, jump in and, and talk about the, some of the, the master's program in particular, um, not necessarily about the mathematics, but the value in getting that. I think um, it, certainly if you're at if you're at Northern Matthew, I, I'm pretty sure I, I know you. Um, so I, I think you're you're here and I'm not sure if the other participants in the meeting are, but yeah, doing a master's at um, in a in a university where you where you currently are has its advantages. There's there's sort of um, small small cost in, in having to transfer. Sometimes there's a bit of lost in, um, energy in moving to places. Um, so that's that's one one thing um, I can say good about the program here at Northern in particular. Um, Heather asked a question in the, in the in the chat about how common is it uh, for there to be interdisciplinary partnerships between math and art, and in some ways it's it's a it's un it's uncommon, but but not because we um, there's no interest for the for a while since I've been here I've wanted to um, do something with with the art department um, here. It's just a, just a um, you know, we get caught up in our own, in our own areas, I suppose, is, is probably the excuse as to why that's been the case, because there's just so much there. There's not only is there this connection between sort of uh, symmetry and asymmetry, that's sort of a mathematical, uh, mathematics has something to say there. These, these groups that Dan was mentioning earlier um, have a, are, are really a, a mathematical way of, of, of expressing symmetry. And of course, symmetry is a, a, a critical element in art. Um, but also the, the way in which mathematicians arrive at their results is often described as, as, some, as a, in a similar way as the way an artist might. It's often many of the many deep results are created in fits of creative of, of bursts. And that's, we, we, we've heard this story from artists who create with paint and, and, and 
and, and also mathematicians. We've those both some we've heard stories like that common across both aisles. Um, this is probably kind of shameless on my part, but this thing behind me is in some way a, a, a kind of a mathematical piece of um, art or an artistic piece of math. Um, it's a it the if if there wasn't space at the top, um, if it wasn't sort of lifting, then it would be a portion. It would be about um, uh, nine. Uh, not not a, about uh, what's three about a quarter. It would be a just about a quarter, maybe an eighth of a of a tessellation. The center of which would be this little uh, decagon right to the to the edge there. So that little sort of circular thing is a is a uh, decagon, and it's the center of this piece that has sort of tenfold symmetry. And so um, there's the the coloring is sort of distracts from the, the pattern itself. But anyway, I, I, an undergraduate um, and I were thinking about this particular shape and trying to classify it a while back. And that, that is one of the reasons why it's on the wall. But um, I know Dan and I have chatted many times about doing, making some tighter connections between math and the, and the arts because we, we, we both love it and we know it's there. So. To follow up on that too, um, actually, I think most people who, who have um, gone through the education system here in Michigan, at least, most people have done math and art at the same time without even realizing it. When you take um, an art class, you have to do those drawings where you have the perspective and you have to do the horizon line. Well, first of all, that's a line. And so anything above the line and below the line, remember it has to be parallel to the horizon line. So you've already got the parallel lines which never touch, which are related to zero. Yeah, see Thompson, that's called synergy. Now, um, also when you're drawing those shapes and you're drawing the buildings in relation to respect to that horizon line, you have to look at the ratios of how long does the building have to be. And it's truly amazing. I mean, even if you were to look at like Bob Ross, how he, just draws these free shapes, the little happy little trees and the ones that are closer are bigger. And you just see this perspective that's happening and you don't even realize the ratios that are going on in his head. He might not be doing the calculations number by number, but the idea behind it that these objects are getting smaller by some ratio because of the way we're looking at it um, is, is really beautiful and physically beautiful because you can look at the art afterwards. Um, and that's something that is they kind of rush over in those classes, in the art classes, they don't talk about the math behind it, but there truly is a lot of math behind just making a simple portrait of a cityscape that you have to do. Um, and that was actually talked about at, at a conference that I had the luxury of going to um, when I came here through NMU and I never would have even thought about that twice had I not gone there. So again, small world, dominoes. So also really quickly, piggyback off Anthony, um, a huge, really tangible connection between art and math is biomimicry. Um, why does the Fibonacci sequence so show up in petals around a flower? Why is the perfect train shaped like a uh, certain type of bird? Uh, why do stealth bombers look like hawks as they're diving? Um, why do planes look like whales? And all the different stuff that mathematically becomes this tangible, visible way of nature is producing math because it's that relationship between this is the most efficient or this is the perfect way of creating these things that just comes out through the simple development of cells. Yeah, the honeycomb that bees make, it's a hexagon because I guess you do the calculation and it, it optimizes. It's the most amount of volume with the strongest structure with the minimal surface area because they use their saliva or whatever to build the honeycomb. So yeah, they're hexagons. The math comes up through, through nature. And there are these great connections that we've been describing between um, math and art and nature. And to, to, to keep going on your question there, Heather, it would be, it would be incredible to eventually make stronger bonds with the art department here or even biology. 
and to get some interdisciplinary master's projects in that in that regard. But uh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that in the future, hopefully. I must add that we, we can't always say this, but I, I think now we can. It really is great to be a mathematician. You can, we can, we can talk and, and connect with so many different um, disciplines. It's, it's, it's legitimate. I mean, the math biology world is, is, is the reason why we were able to get uh, vaccines in the hands of, of, of people in record time. Um, that's been established for a while. I mean, math and physics has been established for a while. Um, so we, we really are um, a, a device, diverse bunch, or at least we have the ability to be. Yeah, just really quick, because when I was an undergrad, I had the major in math and then the minor in bio to teach. And I remember people were were shocked that I would pick that combination. But I always thought there was a wonderful connection between the two subjects, and I thought it could be taught that way. Um, so I'm glad, Dr. Thompson, that, that you see it that way as well. Oh, certainly. That I'm not just crazy, <laughs> at least about that. Um, and another thing on that is one thing I always find in common with math and bio, because I also have um, my minor in bio because I started pre-med, so I took a bunch of bio classes. So I was like, well, already ahead on that. Let's get my minor in that. Um, the biggest intersection I find is um, between math and biostatistics because statistics plays a big role um, in plotting data, um, which in particular, uh, given the vaccine, that's totally a biological thing that we use to model um, with statistics, which is how we included math in that, which is what I really love um, because that's kind of what I see my future being is going into um, biostats. So that's kind of my take on it. I also agree. Oh, uh, Matthew, you don't have to apologize for all the questions. This is great. I know we're approaching eight o'clock, so we can try to wrap up pretty soon, but I do, I do want to answer this question you have here. Um, I'm a math physics major, so I'm trying to decide whether I want to go to grad school for math or physics, maybe both. Exactly. As per the discussion, maybe both would be, would be great. Um, what's the benefits of a mathematics master's? And I, I, I think I, I agree with Josh completely. When I was young, getting interested in, in mathematics, like, like pretty early on for me, I started to catch the bug of math. Uh, it might've been high school somewhere. I, I started to think like, I wanna learn language and I wanna learn representation really well because I, I want the ability to communicate with as many people as possible and um, understand things th through a lens. Um, and mathematics is really like, for me, it's, it's the queen of science because it, if you understand mathematics well, you can talk to physicists, economists, biologists, chemists, you can talk to statisticians. It, it, I really feel that everything is math and, and you have to translate the language. It might be written in confusing ways, but if you have cut your teeth thinking about basic mathematical structures, they're gonna pop up and you'll be fine. And you'll be able, you'll be a, a dynamic individual. So I like myself, I like, I wanted to invest in learning about math because it was so abstract. You could see, you could apply it in different situations. That was, that was my reasoning. Um, I would also add to that the specifically having a master's degree in mathematics. I, I think you would be pretty employable. I think if you just decided after that, that was the time in which you were ready to go out into the workforce, you would have no trouble, I would argue, finding a job. Sort of teaching at various levels would be an option. I just was reminded of an article just a couple of years ago um, for that data analysis uh, analysts, which of course, like that's still not, I don't know that we've hit our peak of having enough data analysis um, analysts. So I think um, that is still a, an area that's um, hiring folks. And I think we're starting to use some other mathematical, well, we're all um, some, some newer mathematical ideas in, in that, for example, the, um, I think the particular example was the volume, so in hyperbolic space, the volume of a ball um, as, a, as it grows 
it grows exponentially. Whereas if you take if you take the volume of a ball in Euclidean space, and as it grows, that volume will 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 it's a polynomial equation, and so the volume will increase polynomially. So in hyperbolic space, somehow more data can be uh, concentrated, can be can be stored in a smaller region because you're you're just using the space more efficiently, and this is an example of something of, of a way you might get your foot in the door at say um, a data analyst gig because you've had some exposure to uh, higher mathematics. Also at the interview, Matt, when they um, ask you, are you good at problem solving? Well, you reach in your wallet, you pull out that wallet sized master's mathematics degree that you're gonna have in your wallet that's nicely laminated and you just slide it across the counter without saying anything, you nod and you go, I think that answers it. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks, Matthew, for asking some questions. This, this, this has uh, been good. Yeah, I gotta say for our first time doing this, this is a, an interesting model. I like it. It's, it's cozy. It's actually a lot of fun to hang out with everyone on a Wednesday night, actually. Well, I don't want to go past eight. I think one hour is sufficient. So any, anyone want to throw anything together here real quick before we uh, head out for the evening? I have a, a really small one. My really small one is if you want to look at a really cool math problem, look up the Futurama theorem. They created a theorem for Futurama on how if everyone switched brains and bodies, how you could get everyone back into their proper body without swapping the same people more than once. <laughs> that's great. All right, well, I, I think that's the end. So this has been recorded, I presume, and you'll, the recording will be available on YouTube. I'll, I'll try to announce where it is. It should be findable relatively easily. Um, yep, okay. I don't know. I. I uh, I suppose we'll we'll end there and uh, wish everyone a good evening and thanks for thanks for attending this. And yeah, looking forward to part two, Katie. Right, right. Yes, thanks everybody. Bye.